Am I on? I am. Nice work, Ron. Good morning, Saints. Good morning, Sinners. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some, I'm hearing the same good morning from the same voices there. <laughs> so that, that's an interesting question, you know, is are you a saint or a sinner? You know, what's interesting is um, if you look in Scripture, a saint is anyone that is in Christ. That person's a saint, okay? So inversely, a sinner, it isn't really used biblically the way we use it today, where we kind of say, hey, we're all sinners, we're all sinners. You know, that's, that's really kind of taken from Paul, you know, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and so on. But if you look biblically at the term sinner, um, it's always used to refer in the New Testament to someone who is in open rebellion against God, right? And so if you're a follower of Jesus, that makes you a saint, not a sinner. That's good news, isn't it? Hey, praise the Lord. So good morning, saints. <laughs> and sinners, too, if you're here and you haven't chosen Jesus. Well, I hope you'll do so because it's a wonderful choice. Amen, saints? Amen. All right, we're going to continue on our study of the book of Revelation. This is the third message. We had one that was like an introduction, and then we're going through the seven churches now, and this one is uh, the second church here, Jesus' message to Smyrna. And um, you've seen the verses here. Actually, uh, Phil read this to us uh, it, for the, like the opening scripture, and so I encourage you when we're doing those, when you know, we're standing and, and he's reading that, to really be paying attention. Of course, always pay attention when, when the Word of God is read, because it's important to know what God's saying to us, right? Uh, but especially in this one, because um, instead of me reading the text, I'm just having him read the text, so we get it in our heads, and then we're going to go through it, and we're going to study it. So let's get a little background here again. Remember, this is the island of Patmos. This is where John was exiled, and and we read last week the message to the church in Ephesus. This week is Smyrna. Next week is Pergamum. And, it, and actually, the sequence just goes, you know, kind of geographically. So Laodicea is the last one when you make your way around of the seven churches. <clears throat> so the city of Smyrna was uh, a very, very old city. It's about, it was 2,000 years old in John's day. So how old does that make it now? about 4,000 years old. It's been around a long time, and it's actually still there. It's called Izmir. It's in Turkey, and it is one of the oldest continually inhabited cities on earth. So there's been a settlement there and people living there for about 4,000 years. I don't know how they know all that, but, you know, it's been a very long time, very, very long time. There's ancient ruins there. Here's some ancient ruins of the Greeks. Or the, probably, actually, it was the Romans who would have probably built something like that. And uh, you've heard of Homer. You know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, well, Homer was, uh, was, they say, from Smyrna. And also this guy, he's kind of a famous guy in church history. This is Polycarp, Polycarp of Smyrna. He was martyred in the year 155 A.D., so about 60 or so years, 65 years after this message to the church in Smyrna. The bishop of Smyrna was, was burned at the stake by, by the Roman authorities. He was 86 years old, and they were persecuting Christians. Smyrna was known as a place that was very hostile to Christians, and we'll see that when we get into the text more here. Um, but he was 86 years old, and the authorities wanted to set an example, um, but they, you know, people usually don't want to do something horrible to a man that's 86 years old publicly, and so maybe get some backlash, maybe get some sympathy for there for the Christians, but they, you know, but, but so, so they actually threatened him with it. They said, you know, we're going we're gonna to burn you at the stake if you don't renounce Christ, and you're an old guy, you know, why don't you just renounce Christ? And, and he wouldn't do it. He's said to have replied when they, uh, when they called him to renounce Christ and he could live, he said, 86 years I've served Jesus, and he's done me no wrong, so how could I now turn my back on him now? You know, so uh, he was actually burned at the stake, and they said, you know, in those days, like with the Romans kind of a form of crucifixion, they would actually nail people to a stake. That's pretty bad, right? You probably want them to burn you after you're going through that. Let's hurry up and get this over with. So they would nail them to a stake and then put the, you know, the, the, uh, the wood and all that around them and burn them. And they were going to nail him. Polycarp said, you don't have to do that. I'm not going anywhere. And they said, okay. So he actually stayed there. That's what, what the stories tell us. So that kind of sets the tone for where we're going in the message because this is actually a pretty intense um, passage of Scripture. Remember, we looked at last week the church in Ephesus. And the issue there with Ephesus was that it was a biblically faithful church, I guess, 
don't know if we say biblically faithful, but it was a church that had high moral standards and a church that definitely took true doctrine, you know, uh, seriously. Jesus commended them for all of that, but he said, I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. So their, their struggle was kind of like a legalism where we're doing, we're, we're doing the right things, but it's not really about Jesus. It's more just about doing them because we should be doing them. And so that was their issue. And what we're going to see here uh, with this church is that Jesus actually comes to this church, not with any rebuke. There's no rebuke um, of the church. He doesn't say, I have this against you. He says that to all the other churches, with the exception of Smyrna and Philadelphia. All the other churches, he said, nevertheless, you know, I have this thing against you. But um, he doesn't say that with them. He really comes to this church with some words of encouragement and comfort, and they need it because this is a church that is under extreme pressure. I mentioned this last week, and I want to reemphasize this. Uh, these were messages to real churches, real places. Now, we, we tend to just kind of view it historically and, and look at it, you know, from our own prism of the 21st century or maybe the 19th century, 20th century, and kind of looking back and see this all historically. And there is, a, I think, a validity to that interpretation. We'll even get into a little bit of that um, in this message. But I want us to remember that these were real churches. There really was a church in Laodicea that, that, that got a message right there from Jesus. There really was a church in Smyrna, a church in Ephesus. And so this had relevance for those people at that time. And I think Jesus is wanting us to see in, in these messages, because it's not just simply for them. The, the book of Revelation is really, uh, it, it, it's a message for Christians of all ages from the time when John's writing this up until the time of the very last days when Jesus comes again. And so there's a message um, for each era of the church. And I think there's some caution against um, extremes. So for instance, last week was on Ephesus, the legalistic church. Um, do you think there's been eras in the history of the church, big picture, maybe even in your own life, um, where legalism has been a problem. What do you think? Amen. Well, of course there has been, right? Of course there was. Some of you might have experienced that, especially if you're a certain age group. I've noticed a lot of kind of baby boomer kind of age group will we'll do a lot of talking about, oh, I was real legalistic when I grew up, you know. And by the way, it wasn't just in our, in our group. It, it, it's other, I've talked to people outside in other denominations. It was just sort of a cultural thing. If you were growing up, you know, in the 50s and 60s that, that it was just kind of that was that 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 tended to be kind of the tone of uh, you know of, of of Christianity in America at that time. Pretty pretty big on rules and not 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 as big on relationship. Well, has there ever been a time in history when the church is persecuted? Absolutely. And so this is speaking to that that issue, this issue of the church here in Smyrna. So let's get started reading the text. This is Revelation two and verse nine. Jesus starts out every to every one of these churches with these four words, not an exception. To all seven of them, he says, I know your works. So I know what's going on. I know what you're doing. I know what you're not doing. I know the whole story. And he says, your tribulation. This word in the Greek, the, the, in English, it doesn't really convey how strong this word is. Tribulation, we can say, oh, you know, our trials and tribulations and so on. This word really implies like an like a extreme pressure, like a burden that crushes, it's like extreme tribulation and pressure, like to the point of breaking. And then he says, and your poverty. No, your poverty, but you are rich. There was something in the ancient world known as trade guilds. The closest comparison we would have to that today is like a labor union. 